Okay, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this event uh, entitled Media Ethics and Journalism in Malaysia. The event is uh, brought to you, co-hosted today by the School of Media and Communication, Taylor University based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and Asia Center based in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, my name is James Gomez. Uh, I'm one of the directors at Asia Center. My role today is to facilitate introduction and the discussion uh, when the speakers uh, speak and, and during the Q&A session. So very happy that all of us uh, could be here together. So uh, we'll just kick off straight away with the welcome remarks. Uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Chamdan Ngammani Udom. He's advisor to the Thai Media Fund based here in Thailand. Um, the Thai Media Fund and the Asia Center have strong uh, cooperation, especially in the areas of dealing with infodemic and media literacy. And we have ongoing discussions uh, with the uh, Thai Media Fund about collaborating on issues of uh, media ethics on a broader regional level. The next speaker is uh, Philip Ganchikiet. He is the Program Director, School of Media and Communication at Taylor's University, uh, Malaysia. Uh, Philip, great to have you here and thank you very much for your schools and universities cooperation. And finally, I have my colleague, Dr. Robin Ramcharan, Executive Director of Asia Center. So without further ado, can I invite Dr. Chamdan to make his uh, welcome remarks. Over to you. James. Uh, thank you, James, for the kind introduction. First of all, it's a great honor for me to be here um, among like my, you know, um, participants who share the ideas of importance of media and uh, especially of media ethics. And I think, you know, I think this problem not only concentrate or occurs in Malaysia, but I think this is a regional or even worldwide phenomena, you know, with the rise of author authoritarian governments, with the rise of big capital and big techs, you know, there's come issues that we sometimes have to question whether media ethics and, you know, free and fair general journalism have a place in this fast changing world. I have to stress that Thai Media Fund, we recognize the importance of free and truthful media as it is important mechanism uh, for check and balance that is vital to the, the uh, functioning of democracy. However, times and times again, we have seen that there are problems that reflect both external influence as well as internal conflicts among the media ethics fields themselves. The external influences may come from the power of authoritarian states, may come from capitalism, or may come from fast evolving and changing technologies that require journalists to report faster and faster. And sometimes this time constraint might jeopardize uh, the, the truth and accuracy uh, function in our ethics. Also, we have seen times and times again that, you know, large capitalists try to influence the uh, reporting uh, of your know, news and uh, situations. And sometimes even we have seen, uh, I would call it, dramatization of news reporting. The situation whereby truth and accuracy in news report have been turned into storytelling. Uh, we have seen this situation domestically and it is one of the points that we are rather worried because when you merge opinions and facts, sometimes the result of uh, journalism may not be in, impartiality and it may create partisan uh, response from the audience. Among the internal conflicts between different media ethics, we have seen that media ethics, we always stress on the importance of truth 
importance of being nonpartisan, being impartiality, uh, being fair, given enough chance for everyone in the society in order to voice their opinions. However, sometimes when truth and speed of new reporting combined, they might infringe on the privacy or even protection of victims. We have seen situation in Thailand in the last couple of years whereby live reporting actually was quite harmful during one shooting incident in the Northeast, whereby victims were reportedly calling live to seek help via media, channel, uh, via media agencies, which were then broadcast live on various platforms, which may be harmful to the victims in that situation themselves. So given all this external influence and internal conflicts between media ethics, I think reason why we should sit together and discuss on how should we propose a new media ethics and journalism in a new 21st century that is in accordance with the development of various socioeconomic factors that have created a new environment. Media ethics should not be a function by journalists themselves. It should not be instigated or it should not be created by the government or by any individual agencies. But media ethics should be a cumulative norms that is built by particip participation among all members in the society, among all group of audience, among all stakeholders in the social sectors, state and big capital should only be a part of this wide, wider development in order to promote a value that is acceptable with and in accordance with our Southeast Asian cultural norms. And I think in this region, we have a strong culture that can be an important foundation. We have a culture of tolerance. We have culture of diversity. And these cultures, I think are vital parts in order to promoted to be a cornerstone of the shaping of our media journalism in this region. So I will end my thought here and I wish you guys all the wonderful ideas and you know creative workshop from this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chamnan, for those uh, remarks and pointing out that it's a trend also in the region and globally and pointing out some of the features uh, uh, that shape or impact media ethics. I'll now turn the time to Philip Gunn, Program Director at the School of Media and Communication, Taylor's University. Philip, over to you. Um, thank you, James. Uh, thank you, the, uh, Dr. Chamnan, for your remarks as well. Uh, very good afternoon to uh, everyone. Uh, for joining this uh, webinar that's hosted and organized by uh, Asia Center in collaboration with uh, the School of Media and Communications at uh, Taylor's University. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be invited to give this opening remarks. Um, I don't think I'll be giving a lot of very academic perspectives um, as when it comes to the area of media ethics, uh, both as a practitioner and also as an academic as well. Um, but allow me to um, tell you a couple of stories about touching on, on this area. Um, when I was a student, uh, we had a class uh, of media ethics. We have a class on media ethics as well. It's pretty much standard uh, in all universities with media programs that 
you know, you got to have this uh, media ethics uh, component in. So we were discussing about, um, and, and I remember the lecturer bring up the uh, topic of how impossible is, is, is media ethics in the realm of the possible or the impossible? Is it, can it be a reality for practitioners to uh, practice media ethics or is it a, a concept that is uh, fantasy that is good to have, but not possible to achieve or not possible to practice? Uh, and now looking back, uh, as we are in this current times of the pandemic and dealing with uh, a, a glut of information from uh, questionable sources and um, with people talking about uh, a lot of um, information that is, um, you know, um, not credible and, and um, as well as very, um, how to say, um, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, that is, you know, in the realm of um, fake news and half truths and things like that. So uh, as practitioners, we are dealing with this kind of things right now. And when I was a student, when the lecturer brought up this concept of impossibility, that media ethics could be difficult to achieve. and I reflected on this, uh, even as I am uh, speaking with you all today. Um, history of journalism has proved otherwise, that when it comes to the issue of ethics, that there are journalists out there, there are media practitioners out there who strive to you know, maintain a, a high standard of uh, journalism that continues to uh, strive for accuracy, that continues to strive for objectivity, to really be able to, uh, you know, they really consider their reporting, the impact of their reporting. And as long as it benefits the people, as long as it offers uh, the greatest benefit, as long as it offers uh, the greatest impact and influence that helps people for the better, that helps society for the better, um, they were willing to, to take a chance to risk their reputations, to risk their lives, to, to risk, um, you know, making, uh, you know, uh, decisions that may threaten them. And these are the kind of journalistic reporting that I feel that all of us should aspire to. Um, and it's something that I, as an educator, try to impress uh, on my students. Um, I, I, let, let me share one more story about how this really happened uh, in one of my assignments that I gave my students for this semester. Um, I teach uh, a lot of journalism subjects. So one of the assignments that I gave my students uh, this time around was to uh, was on investigative reporting, that they are supposed to take an issue, go out there, uh, speak to the people, interview them, and um, you know to get some insights on the issue. And one of my students, um, she's one of the best students that I have. I'm very proud of her in terms of the, the work that she, she does and, and that she produces. So she wanted to do on the issue of vaccine uh, hesitancy and also anti-vaxxers. And somehow one way or another, she managed to infiltrate uh, one of these uh, anti-vaxxer groups on Telegram. And um, I, I told her that she has to be careful, um, you know, that, that she, you know, if she wants to get information, she might have to, um, you know, be smart about how to navigate, um, you know, this, uh, you know, asking people in these groups about, you know, the topic that she wants to write and that she may encounter a lot of challenges. So I was thinking to myself when she was presenting about this topic to me was that, you know, you might have to, you know, um, fabricate, you know, impersonate, or, you know, to just tell them that, you know, you're not uh, a student reporter or something like that, but you're also, you know, a fellow anti-vaxxer advocate, you know, wanting to know all this kind of information, you know. So I was like thinking that that was the only way that if she wants to get uh, good information, that was the only way that she would probably get around it because, 
Um, but she didn't. She said that um, I don't think that's right. You know, I, I decided that, you know, I'll be upfront with these people, that I will introduce myself as a student journalist who's working on this story and wants to, you know, talk to people about, you know, why are they uh, an anti vax so, you know, where are they getting all this information? How are they influencing others and things like that? And and that was exactly what she did, you know, in, in the in these telegram groups, she was introducing herself as a student reporter, you know, working on this story. And as you know, it, you know, these people were very reluctant to speak to her, but very reluctant to give her information. And, you know, they were just giving her bits and pieces of information, which she was still able to come up with, with uh, a good story about it. And, and and, and there you go, you know, there are students and also there are future journalists um, that feels that, that still holds on to the principles of integrity, that still holds on to the principle of honesty, that it's possible to be truth, to be truthful to yourselves and to your work in the process of news gathering and reporting. And, and, and I, I, when she told me this, I was really proud of her. I was really say that, you know, if if a lot of our uh, practitioners out there have held the same principles as you do, and I'm sure they do, if they have not been uh, forced to do otherwise by you know, uh, the pressures, uh, the external and the internal pressures that Dr. Chamlin talked about, uh, I'm sure they would be able to, to do really good reporting. And, but the reality of the world that we are living in, especially in this age of disruption with so, so many new technologies and new ways of reporting, the lines are blurred between, um, you know, what is truth and what is fact. And it is up to us uh, media practitioners to help make sense of the world uh, for the people, uh, for, for society, because without us, people will be lost, people will be clueless. Um, a lot of half truths and uh, fake news would cause a world of confusion to the public. So we should, um, I just wanna end on this note that as media practitioners and as media acad academics, um, we should strive and hold on to the ideal that despite how impossible it may seem, uh, it is not impossible to do the right thing. And it's always the right time to do the right thing um, at anywhere, at any place, uh, as long as we do not lose sight that the information that we generate and the stories that we tell to the people are meant for their benefit, are meant for their good, are meant for them to be able to use it to make sense of what's going on around them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip, for you know sharing the uh, uh, snapshots of uh, ethics in practice and uh, pointing to the social dimensions of it. Uh, I will now invite my colleague, Dr. Ramcharan, uh, to give some very brief, very, very brief, <laughs> sure. uh, um, uh, open welcome remarks so that we can get on to the main event. Over to you, Robert. Thank you, James, and welcome to all uh, distinguished uh, speakers and participants. Uh, welcome to this uh, event on media ethics and journalism in Malaysia. Let me start by saying, uh, a thank you uh, to our partners, at Taylor University, the Thai Media Fund, and the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. So uh, thank you all. Uh, I think you all recognize the importance of this topic at this time. Uh, very quickly, I would say that this issue, this theme of media ethics has been around since the dawn of professional journalism. And it has taken uh, it has uh, um, developed, uh, or there is currently great urgency in, in this uh, addressing this theme, especially in the internet age, in the social media age. And on that note, I would like to recognize the uh, Nobel Peace Prize of Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov. Um, and they speak to what Philip was just talking about, uh, the honesty, the holding to account, the fact-based journalism uh, that is so badly needed in, in today's world. And Maria Ressa is one also who has been speaking about, uh, speaking out against uh, or 
being very critical uh, with regards to the tech companies who now run the platforms. And so you have all followed the trials and tribulations of Facebook. Um, you know, Dr. Chamnan talked about the role of the capitalists in producing media content. Uh, and so it's good that we draw attention to that um, and how to improve the algorithm so that they actually weed out the hateful news, the fake news uh, properly and not be driven by profits. And finally, um, this brings us to the crucial element I think for everyone, you as professional media persons, journalists and so on are all too aware of this. Uh, and that is the issue of media literacy for the general population uh, and others. Well, the, <laughs> that includes everyone, right? So um, with that, um, you know, let me turn it over to, to back to James and you all, and we look forward to a engaging and uh, fulfilling discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. Uh, uh, before we kick off uh, to the main event, very excited. You know, uh, we, we wait in anticipation for the first speaker. But before that, just to tease you a little bit, you know, we're going to start with a poll. Uh, the poll reads, um, and it will uh, be coming up on your screen uh, 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 as I announce it. Uh, what is the state of media ethics in Malaysian journalism? Good, moderate, poor, not ethical, I don't know. I'm not from Malaysia, right? Uh, so to take a, a, you know, a 30 seconds or so, uh, uh, please interact with our poll so it gives a sense of uh, uh, people's understanding of media ethics in Malaysian journalism. And also next, uh, uh, no event would be complete without some advertisements. So uh, uh, I think our advertisements are missing here, but I just wanted to announce that uh, look out for our annual conference, uh, which will happen uh, on the 24th to 26th August uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, the theme of the conference is uh, freedom of expression in Asia, academic, media, and internet freedoms. And we look forward to, to having you here in Bangkok, as you know, uh, we are expect, uh, uh, accepting visitors from 1st November. So without further ado, let me uh, uh, invite the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is uh, uh, Wachala Naidu. She's Executive Director uh, of the Center for Independent Journalism. Wachala is currently uh, uh, in charge of this organization, which is a Malaysian civil society organization that focuses on uh, freedom of expression, promoting media freedom, and the right to information. Uh, CIJ also acts as a watchdog to monitor as well as support uh, the media in strengthening uh, the standards of journalism. I know many of you are interested to know uh, what is the status of the media, uh, Malaysian Media Council, of which uh, Washla is a member of the Pro Tem uh, Committee. So I, I'm, I'm sure we'll be hearing um, uh, a little bit about this uh, and other elements. Washla, the floor is yours, and uh, please feel free to share your slides. Yes, thank you very much, James. Um, I think I need, a oh, I'm able to do it now. Thanks. I wonder, um, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, it's just uh, loading up. Uh, yeah, we have it in front. Uh, please uh, press uh, sh uh, the uh, yeah display. Thank you. Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, good afternoon to all. I'm just going to be focusing on something. I guess coming as a first speaker, I'll be you know setting the scene a little bit. When we talk about ethics and you know responsible reporting, we cannot move away from the current media landscape. I thought we would also just uh, highlight certain ethical considerations we have before us, and perhaps um, some discussion on what could be reforms uh, as way forward. Um, Looking at the issues here in Malaysia, I think uh, Dr. Chamran, you said that we cannot, uh, we, we see a lot of commonalities within the region as well. And you're very right because of the structures of our government, because of the crackdowns that we're experiencing, there are many things in common. But one thing that I thought we could locate our discussion within is the issue of economic viability and sustainability of the current media 
models that we have, the business models before us. Because media, you know, even before COVID, um, was already experiencing extensive challenges with regards to its revenue. We saw a lot of readers, my, you know, migrating from traditional media, print media to online digital media. We we saw a deficit in advertising revenues. We saw challenges with regards to online subscription. And of course, when you, you also mentioned the role of these big tech companies, um, multinational corporations like Google, Facebook, who are actually also benefiting from you know, local media content as um, through the advertising revenues that they are getting. So it's because of these challenges, we've in Malaysia, we've seen situations where there is a lot of restructuring going on within uh, media uh, outlets, media organizations, leading to people losing their jobs. There are uh, media outlets um, seizing its operations fully, some reducing its uh, publications and so on. And this is also it's somewhat tied in within the, another landscape we have in Malaysia, which is media ownership. Now, media ownership in Malaysia, uh, more often than not, is also affiliated with you know, certain political uh, leanings. Yeah? So that, in a way, also influences the kind of stories that are published, the, the, the angle that's taken, the ethics that are at play in these instances. Yeah? The other thing, of course, is the issue of restrictions that media has been experiencing more so now, I would say, in the last two years, the crackdown. And this also will have to be you know, seen through the lens of COVID and what that had meant to uh, media in general here in Malaysia. We've seen, of course, um, more and more media, uh, you know, plus the journalists, you know, correspondents who are coming under investigations purely because they have published news which may have you know, placed the government in certain negative lights. We have seen uh, media being, you know, media like Malaysia Kini, who's been hauled into court and, you know, being fined for half a million ringgit. We've also seen um, instances where COVID has been used to justify um, limiting access to media, for example, the parliamentary city. Repeatedly, we have uh, you know, um, announcements where they just identify 15 media with no clear criteria on how these media um, uh, and um, outlets are chosen. Yeah? And of course, this also ties into the issue of the legal framework in Malaysia. The illegal environment by and large, you know, in terms of the way it criminalizes expression has a huge impact on media freedom and media independence. We have the Printing Presses and Publications Act. We have the Official Secrets Act, which limits access to information. We have the Communications and Multimedia Act, which more, uh, regulates online media. So there are Sedation Act, of course, and we don't have a very progressive information regime. Like, unlike many other countries, we don't have a right to information legislation, which will promote access to information. So this, Often what we see are um, uh, instances where these legal, um, these laws have been weaponized or used as tools to further restrict and crack down against media. And of course, earlier there was also mention about fake news. So there is indeed a proliferation of this information. And this needs to also be seen, uh, say, currently in the context of COVID, where there is in fact an infodemic. So how, what, what then becomes the role of media in saving through all this information, competing with social media platforms, uh, compete, you know, dealing with the uh, restrictions that are placed by the government. So there are multiple factors here, which then influences the, the, the ethics around media reporting. You know, there was one somebody, you know, who told me that, you know, you keep talking about standards and ethics, you know, this is like not, an ideal euphoric kind of situation or world you live in, it's reality. But I always think that realities will have to be balanced. You know, Yes, it's reality, but you cannot mean that just because of reality, all ethics and responsible reporting gets com completely compromised. Yeah? Next thing we'll see is, what are some of the considerations here in Malaysia with regards to responsible reporting and ethical reporting? We, we are indeed seeing trends where often it's communities at risk 
uh, that get compromised uh, in, in the way the media uh, reports um, you know, or you know, have news around these communities. And often this, this, again, as I said, cannot be seen in isolation. It's not just purely you know, media not understanding its responsibility and not being clear about the ethics. This also ties into certain propaganda, certain narrative, um, and these are influenced both by state propaganda, religious uh, rhetorics, religious narrative, religious influences, many factors. Like, you know, we saw last year when there were increased um, rates against immigration, refugees, how media actually reported on issues around refugees um, and the connotation and the, and the bias um, uh, with regards to the way the communities were stigmatized. There are also um, other communities at risk, uh, such as the lesbian, bisexual, transgender, um, intersex and queer communities, uh, who often face challenges uh, uh, with regards to how media actually reports on the issues. Recently, we saw the way media had reported on no Sajat's issue by refusing to name her. Yeah, uh, so dead naming itself is a challenge to ethical reporting. Of course, the way uh, media looks at um, suicide in the recent uh, months, I would say it's also problematic and the role that they play in that context. Media and the role with regards to how they look at ethical reporting around gender issues. Uh, these are numerous um, areas where you know, communities at risk intersect with critical issues um, that requires media to take on more of a transformative role. But on the other hand, we see instances where media tend to, uh, the ethics tend to be compromised for the various reasons um, that perhaps uh, are linked to what I had shared earlier. So these are some consideration. And I want to also stress that one of the biggest challenge we have here in Malaysia is the, you know, is around the issue of investigative journalism. You know, um, uh, Mr. Gunn, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, how passionate your, your student is because these are the kinds of students we're actually missing out on, right? And if, if we don't have these students who are willing to go, you know, above and beyond what's expected of them and infiltrating a telegram group, it's not an easy method, you know, and wanting to be very, ethical about that role is so fundamental and so crucial. You know, and Maria Ressa is not the only examples. We do have examples here in Malaysia as well. You know, uh, journalists who push the boundaries, journalists who want to make sure that, you know, the, the reality is it's heard. And I think uh, all of us facing the Pandora's papers now recognize how important Ethical reporting is so uh, uh, intertwined with investigative journalism. So we can be, you know, by promoting ethical reporting, in a way, we are also promoting investigative journalism and upholding the role, the, the role of media as a fourth pillar of society. You know, without the media and without ethical media, ethical reporting, we will miss this, this flow of information that would enable us to hold the, the relevant actors to account. Uh, finally, I just wanted to just locate some of these discussions. I know, I know I'm running out of time, but and I'm sure these will come out again in the Q&A session. But in pushing forward um, ethical reporting, um, as I said, again, it cannot happen in vacuum. You can't just say these are your ethical standards and these are what you're supposed to be doing, but that needs to still be located within the larger environment that media is facing. And one thing that SDIJ, we've always been uh, a proponent of, uh, pushing forward the establishment of the Malaysian Media Council. We look at the Malaysian Media Council, not necessarily, you know, they, they only answer to all our current challenges, but I think as a positive and progressive way of addressing some of these challenges, because having an independent self-regulatory body, it's, it's one step, because this body, you know, in trying to govern itself more independently, would also work, you know, with both the carrot and whip coming up with the necessary standards, but at the same time, creating the mechanisms to hold the media uh, outlets owners uh, you know, to account to uh, implementing and upholding these standards. Yeah? 
And of course, the Malaysian Media Council in itself can't work without the le necessary legal reforms. I think, um, you know, Benjamin, you're going to be speaking more about the, the legal landscape in Malaysia, so I won't touch too much on that. But moving forward, one of the biggest considerations we have here is we really need to rethink the business model of media. You know, this was also a discussion that came up last week, you know, when Maria Reza was um, actually got the call um, when she won the Nobel Peace Prize, was at a forum, a regional forum that we had co-hosted together with our partners in uh, Indonesia and Philippines, but uh, together with Tempo, Malaysia Kini, and of course the Rappler, was the fact that media, you know, for media to survive, for ethical reporting to survive, we need to rethink what would be the, via, the, you know, the economically viable model that would enable it to, you know, to address the current challenges. Um, you know, thank you for bringing up media literacy again, um, because I think a lot of our discussion is also located on the necessity for media literacy, not just amongst the you know, students, but really the community, the re readers from our side as well, because we are not just taking in information, we are also digesting information, and we need to have a clear understanding you know, of what we want to expect from media as well. And finally, I'm just thinking, you know, within Malaysia, if we are moving towards multi-stakeholder kind of engagement, there needs to also be the possibility of regional collaboration, because if we can't shout enough at the national level, I think louder voices at the regional level uh, may have some level of consistency in the framework that we have used. Um, earlier, it was stated that we need to think about this within the regional contacts and regional priorities. So, um, you know, reforms around media ethics could also be, you know, both from ground up, but also region to us, because we need to re unpack all these and unpack what media ethics means to us here in Southeast Asia first, um, and then see how we can apply the general standards and other lenses to how we approach this. On that note, I'll stop first, and I'm happy to take on the questions um, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Washla, for setting the scene. Uh, perhaps at this stage, you know, uh, it'd be good to know uh, what our poll answers are. Uh, we had a high participation rate of over 80%. So um, is, uh, what is the state of media ethics in journalism? Uh, is it good? 2% uh, said to be good. Is it moderate? 49% of you said it's moderate. Uh, poor, 26% said uh, it, it was poor. And not ethical, 9% said it was uh, not ethical, and then 14% said, I don't know. So uh, the bulk of the answers you know, fall between moderate and poor. So this is just to give an indication of uh, how um, you know, our participants you know, perceive uh, media ethics in Malaysia, and perhaps this will set the tone for our other speakers uh, to kind of dig in. So our next speaker is Tamina. Kaushi, an independent broadcast journalist, gender activist, and communication consultant uh, based in Malaysia. Tamina has over eight years of live breaking news and current affairs uh, uh, programming. Uh, she worked for quite some time at the uh, Malaysian National uh, News Agency known as Panama. And she has part participated in a range of uh, media workshops as a speaker and as a participant including international ones held in Germany and Estonia. Uh, Tamina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. James, Asia Center, Taylor's Uni for the invitation. It's a really timely topic. Uh, I'd delight to provide some perspectives on media ethics and journalism in Malaysia from an independent broadcast journal's perspective. Uh, thanks also to Wachala. I think that was a great overall uh, perspective. And I think it's a really well-rounded panel because each one of our speakers will be able to provide hopefully um, a little bit more enlightenment on different sectors and areas of interest in the media. So of course, it's been a long 19 months in Malaysia since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdowns, which of course are easing up now. We've also um, very importantly had two governments and all two new governments and all the accompanying readjusting of the news media landscape considering, of course, the 34 or so laws and sub-laws which continue to restrict freedom of expression as well as press freedom. Um, so I'd like to focus on um, three specific areas. 
to help break down the actual state of media ethics in Malaysian journalism. Um, firstly, I'd like to speak a little more on challenges with reporting over the pandemic. Um, so with movements that were restricted, journalists were either locked down at home or only allowed to attend press conferences if they are from state broadcasters or selected media houses. Day-to-day -day reporting, of course, was very challenging and restricted. Um, I also want to make the point that vaccine rollouts during the initial stages also failed to prioritize Malaysian media workers as essential frontliners, despite reporters, press photographers, camera persons being on the ground daily. Um, many of our media colleagues thus also fell ill with COVID during the earlier parts of the pandemic. Now, um, the changes in government that I'd referred to, they also came hand in hand with investigations under the Sedition Act overall doubling in 2020, while probes under Section 233 of Comms and Multimedia Act, the CMA, they almost tripled over the year. Um, and it's clear how these broader acts are also tools being used to silence current media. Um, since the onset of the pandemic, journalists have been called up by the authorities, including the police, um, NCMC, for doing their job, labeled as fake news for critical reporting, such as the May Day COVID-19 raid last year of migrant workers and subsequent coverage, uh, restricted from, as I said, government press briefings and conferences, and personally attacked by politicians and their online mob. Uh, now, another dimension of this is the online gender-based violence faced by female journalists. In fact, disproportionately from the media professionals called up for investigation, they were all Malaysian female journalists. So um, each of the above factors, of course, is magnified. The journalist in question is an independent media professional without the backing of a newsroom, which also points to the critical need for reform. As we've also seen with, our, uh, with the media landscape in general, many, many more of us are actually going freelance or independent. So this huge disconnect between the media functioning as a fourth estate while being subject to this pushback, it's all happening all at once, all together. Um, there's also, of course, a monopoly over tone and tone policing of media, which is enforced by the restrictive laws. So this, of course, augurs poorly, not just for pandemic management right now, but of course, wider interconnected issues of public trust, political accountability, and of course, you know, in the long run, national stability and economic recovery. Um, I'd also like to point out that as with working mothers globally, Pandemic career sacrifices and job security issues fell mostly on mothers rather than fathers. I'm talking, of course, about the motherhood penalty, a lack of childcare, and increased unpaid care work demands over the pandemic. All these are continuing issues, even as the economy has opened up, particularly affecting uh, female journalists in Sabah and Sarawak and more rural areas. We're not just focusing on the urban areas, right? Um, from there, we, let's move on to the second topic I'd like to um, speak a little bit more about, media and self-regulation. So, of course, um, I will speak a little bit about um, what progress has or has not been made on the establishment of the uh, proposed Malaysian Media Council, of which I'm also a pro community member. Um, well, overall, of course, ideally, journalism has an ethical and ought also to have a moral compass. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that specifically in Southeast Asia and even in Malaysia, the problem often is that when half-truths, uh, when they're shouted repeatedly on social media platforms, they eventually gain a lot of acceptance in the absence of a counter-argument of equal value, which is what we've been seeing when it comes to particularly vaccine disinformation and even vaccine hesitancy. Um, and in Malaysian news media, there is a lack of accountability for sensationalism, clickbait, disinformation, uh, fake news, biased reporting. So, of course, political brown nosing or a lack of responsibility towards freedom of in information becomes the norm rather than the exception. So all of this, once again, combines with another double conundrum. There's increasing digital equity and connectivity. Um, NCMC's uh, 2018 Internet User Survey showed that close to 88% of Malaysians are online as Internet users. But Cybersecurity Malaysia research shows Malaysians ignore journalism, they prefer social media, and this, of course, increases their exposure to the infodemic, to hate speech, um, to participating in online violence against minorities, and, of course, online gender-based violence against women and girls. 
Well, as for um, the brief update on the status of the Media Council initiative, so one of the positive things which happened during the PH administration before the pandemic was progress made towards the establishment of the Malaysian Media Council. Um, it's been almost 40 years in the making, all told. And um, the process stalled, though, with changes in the government. And meanwhile, the pro -tem committee, uh, we've been waiting in the wings with our finalized draft bill um, since February 2020. So we need a media council. And perhaps even more importantly, the accompanying code of conduct for media to oversee the daily snafus that we see. So, I mean, we're speaking about wider and much more complex questions when it comes to state-sponsored disinformation campaigns, and of course, trust in journalism, which runs, uh, mistrust in journalism, which runs broadly and deeply, especially in Malaysia. Um, very quickly, um, let's go into the last topic I'd like to speak a little bit more about, which is media and sustainability. Can't escape from this. And going back once more to the 34 or so laws and sub laws that impact freedom of expression, this also has a direct impact on media sustainability because it restricts the quality of news which journalists and news organizations can produce. And this especially curbs um, investigative journalism and solutions journalism in the public interest, particularly when it comes to the quality of news that we've seen over the pandemic. So when journalists can't access the data we need, especially granular, gender disaggregated data, when access to press conferences is restricted to only official media outlets, um, this has actual daily grievous repercussions on the news cycle. So news consumers, um, I'm sure uh, many of us uh, in the audience too, you'll easily note how this actually results in foreign media consistently breaking some of the biggest news stories in Malaysia rather than local news media outlets. So a much larger fallout of the laws is that it results in the spread of fake news, disinformation, especially as more and more Malaysians, they just access whatever they need on a daily basis news-wise via social media or viral posts rather than via dedicated news channels or even official news media websites. Um, speaking on media sustainability, to dig a little bit deeper, the Institute of Journalists Malaysia, of which I am a board member, we actually conducted the first Malaysian media salary survey back in 2018. Uh, and we discovered that the average salary of journalists does not actually cover living costs. So this means even those who are staff journalists, uh, unless of course you are at a higher pay scale, you're often still doing freelancing and gig work on the side in addition to your um, actual full-time uh, duties. So almost half of the 207 journalists that were polled in 2018 felt that their current pair of pay was barely survivable, while only less than 5% stated that they were happy with their current salary scheme. Um, but you know, when it boils down to it and all said and done, it's not all doom and gloom. I think as journalists, we've really been so heartened by Maria Reza's recent Nobel Peace Prize win. Plus, uh, we also saw Malaysia Kini's 500,000 fine for contempt of court raised via crowdfunding in under six hours. I think that's not, that wasn't only just a huge shot in the arm and a boost of confidence for the hardworking reporters and editors at MKINI, but it also did show that when it really does matter, Malaysians too will you know, come together and hold the line. Um, so to wrap it up, um, the main working challenges in Malaysia's media landscape are media freedom, the freedom of information, media ethics, and media sustainability. Um, that's all I have for now, and of course, open to questions and looking forward to my fellow presenters. Back to you, James. Thank you, Tamina, for, for doing a deep dive and, you know, sharing with us uh, the impact, you know, uh, on female journalists, um, the developments with the Media Council and the need for a code of conduct, as well as, you know, elements that affect media sustainability. I'll now move on to our next speaker, Dr. Benjamin Lowe, who is Senior Lecturer at School of Media and Communication, Taylor's University. Ben is also an Asia Centre Associate and has recently participated in uh, Asia Centre's regional activities, and this is part of um, our efforts to uh, collaborate uh, uh, in light of the Asia Centre also opening a, a branch in Malaysia, uh, in Johor Bahru, and we look for future collaborations, not just only with Ben, but also colleagues in Malaysia. So Ben, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, James. Uh, yeah, so uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, the other talks from the other presenters, Tamina and Washla, were very, very interesting. And I'm hoping to sort of like follow in their footsteps to provide uh, even more sort of like contextual information in regards to the situation that is being faced by journalists in Malaysia, essentially. So let me just share my slides uh, very, very quickly. So what I'll be talking about today, essentially, hold on. All right, is that I want to be looking at sort of like um, to provide further context that has been sort of like teased upon by Washla and also Tamina. Uh, I want to sort of like focus more on like what are the challenges faced by Malaysian journalists and what is the contextual uh, environment that journalists are operating here essentially. So as Washa sort of like touched very, very lightly, uh, traditional media in Malaysia generally is regulated by uh, printing the Printing Presses and Publications Act. So uh, traditional media is pretty much very, very locked down in this country, essentially. Uh, very, very heavily regulated, uh, very, very controlled by the government in that sense. But the online media space uh, has been regulated in a very, very different way as well. It's more indirect using the Communications and Multimedia Act through various different uh, legal uh, frameworks as well. And one very, very good example of how uh, the government uses very sophisticated indirect measures of attacking uh, journalists and the media would be with the recent uh, contempt, of, uh, contempt of court with Malaysia Kini, where uh, Malaysia Kini essentially were if you're not familiar with the case, that was when Malaysia Kini was charged for contempt of court over comments that people made on their website in the comment section, essentially. So these are sort of like the extraneous ways in which um, the state apparatus is used to sort of go against the media in various shapes and forms. And in addition to that, freedom of speech is also restricted through other legal frameworks as well. Uh, as mentioned before, we've got the Defamation Act, Sedition Act, and of course, the Penal Code. All of these things have been used in very, very different ways to restrict and to confine uh, Malaysian media to only report on things that are generally favorable to the government and are not very, very critical in nature, essentially. Okay, uh, so all of this is sort of like put together with very, very uneven and selective prosecution that we're seeing. Uh, we notice also that, you know, certain media outlets, often those that have uh, sort of like very, very strong political backing, they often are not targeted in a certain sense. Or whenever there is a change in government or there's change in uh, certain um, political shifts, Southern prosecution is often taking place as a result of that. So the Malaysian media environment, despite the fact that it sounds as though you know we're heavily regulated, is actually a very new, it's very neoliberal in nature. You know, uh, there are a lot of private-based media outlets that operate within the Malaysia space, though there is a lot of indirect partisanship, essentially whereby there's a lot of oblique media ownership through proxies of political entities. So many of the media outlets in Malaysia do have some political links either direct or indirect ownership in that sense. Um, and as was pointed out by Tamina, you know, the independent media face a lot of risk and liability because they often lack political or establishment that is going to support them through these hard times, essentially. Okay, uh, the local media, therefore, has evolved to only really focus on providing the basic functions of journalism within a very, very fraught legal minefield, essentially. So in order to sort of avoid the gaze of the government or any sort of like pressures, they often just focus on providing the bare minimum required for journalists, essentially. Okay, so what does this then mean for Malaysian journalists? So um, I'm just going to sort of go into the next session to sort of contrast what, uh, what is a, an example of what we believe to be a good code of ethics. So again, there are many different competing code of ethics. So the one that I'll be presenting here today will be based off the Society of Professional Journalists uh, Code of Ethics. And I'm going to sort of highlight the differences between the professional responsibilities of a journalist and also the social responsibilities that journalists have. And in Malaysia, uh, the, our journalists, due to the limited nature or the suppressed nature in which they operate, tend to focus more on the professional responsibility and have not been too uh, focused on the social responsibility aspect. So I'm just going to provide some sort of like overview because a lot of these issues have been touched by Tamina and Washla before, and I believe that uh, Zurairi will be touching on a bit more as well. So for professional responsibility, the most obvious one, of course, is just the idea of very, very simple news reporting. So uh, in general, uh, when it comes to news, especially in today's sort of like highly uh, rapid news cycle age, fast, it, it's not just enough that you have to be accurate with your news, you also have to be fast. And more often than not, a lot of our, some of our media outlets today 
in the in the desire to beat social media to sort of getting the scoop on news will often publish news that is not properly verified properly vetted resulting in sometimes problematic news being presented uh, more often than not also our news tends to be a little bit shorter uh, more so because i think as was highlighted by tamina people do consume news through social media and when they consume news in that fashion they tend to often read just headlines they don't read they don't need to read so much into the news and therefore a lot of news media outlets tend to avoid putting in very, very important contextual information. So that's something that we're noticing is uh, has is sort of like the situation that's present in Malaysia with regards to new, news reporting. A lot of it is done in a way to sort of like meet the needs of what they feel that will allow media outlets to produce news in a very rapid fashion uh, and in a way that will allow them to uh, sort of like meet the needs of what they perceive the audience wants essentially. Uh, the next, next aspect also is sort of like the differences in protecting your sources and also exposing dangerous behaviors. Um, uh, one of the biggest uh, tools that our local journalists like to use, especially when it comes to political reporting, is they like to always present anonymous sources. So under the uh, a more general code of ethics, anonymity often should only be res re reserved for very, very specific cases where harm is to prevent um, harm to being caused and to protect people in precarious situations. But more often than not, a lot of political based news, especially rumors, tend to be presented through the use of anonymous sources or sources within a party that doesn't want to be named. And that, in effect, allows creates a very problematic space where it's very difficult to vet whether information is, uh, whether news is accurate or not. And on top of that, there's also this, uh, because we do have a lack of a codified uh, body of sort of like code of ethics within Malaysia, if you ask different journalists, they'll give you a different set of code of ethics because we've actually got competing uh, code um, sort of like code of ethics between different journalist groups in this country, essentially. And as a result of that, uh, journalists tend to not want to expose unethical conduct, whether within the same organization or in different organizations, which in turn causes uh, there to be, there is no standardized set. And that is something where the media council can hopefully step in and to sort of like correct, do some course correction for this essentially. Okay. Uh, next also, of course, is this idea of professional transparency. Uh, one of the, a few of the more sort of like traditional media outlets are kind of guilty of doing this, whereby instead of labeling, carefully labeling what are advocacy or commentary or even um, advertise or sponsored content, they tend to just sort of blend it into their main content essentially. And that can be perceived as compromising the quality of the news that's being presented. Uh, there's also certain issues where certain news is just sort of republished or uh, plagiarized without proper attribution. And one common issue also is that when news published when news outlets publish uh, information that is often incorrect or there are some issues with accuracy, the response to these claims are often a little bit slow and often uh, not quick enough, essentially, which can therefore lead people to uh, doubt the quality of that media outlet in the long term. And finally, of course, the main issue and one of the main reasons why uh, the news in Malaysia is the way it is, is that there are a lot of legal concerns, essentially, you know. Uh, one of the main things, of course, is that, and one, this is the one aspect that I would say that even though the Malaysian media are focused on uh, sort of like on, on issues regarding um, avoiding the legal eye of the state, essentially, that somehow has sort of blurred the lines between what kind of information they need to publish. And one of the key issues that really emerges from this is that there is often a poor distinction between private people and public figures, essentially, whereby certain times, you know, certain uh, people, even though they are private in nature, their public information are released uh, without uh, you know, almost reckless fashion by certain media outlets, essentially. And essentially, this is one of a very, very huge concern that we're seeing quite a bit. And I think uh, Washla sort of mentioned that a little bit with certain cases, especially with Noor Sajad and uh, other individuals that have happened in recent times. So these are some of the, the professional responsibilities that the me that media practitioners are often um, should be adhering to, but have not in the interest of economic, uh, sort of like economic needs, essentially. Okay, so the next one I like to go for, and this is the part where it's more aspirational because a lot of these aspects um, have been forgotten by various media outlets here uh, in this country, essentially. This idea that uh, social responsibility uh, is actually a key component of being uh, a journalist, essentially. You know, you are first and foremost supposed to serve as the public watchdog. The main goal of a journalist is to monitor public affairs and government 
and to hold those in power accountable. I think the recent publication of the Pandora Papers was a very, very prime example of investigative journalism working uh, at its best, essentially. Something that is you know, transnational at an international capacity and can only be done through journalist uh, efforts. And if you're going to the issue of investigative journalism, while you know, uh, Malaysia Kini and a few other media outlets are sort of like engaging in this and keeping that uh, sort of like habit alive, that all, you will notice that within the Malaysian context, you will very rarely see investigative journalism pieces. And often if there are, very rarely do they touch on more sensitive uh, issues related to politics or things that are critical of the government. So that's one of the main issues that's also present as well. Uh, another point that also has been forgotten by a lot of media outlets is the idea that journalists also have a responsibility to give voice to the voiceless. The idea here is that they not only just have to present um, news that they perceive that is only meant to cater to mainstream needs and desires, but they also need to provide diverse perspectives and viewpoints as well. Um, you know, stereotyping is one key point that it's always forgotten and certain news outlets still do engage in this very, very, uh, in the dangerous perpetuation of stereotypes. They often ignore minority viewpoints and they do not often allow marginalized groups from having a voice and sometimes do in fact attack them in that sense. So that's one major concern that uh, is really quite present in, unfortunately, in the Malaysian space in, that, in, in this case. Uh, next, of course, is this whole idea also of deciding the need to publish or broadcast. Uh, I think this is very similar to the previous point on uh, sort of like, you know, keeping private information in a certain sense. And this is where uh, journalists also need to be mindful that, you know, you need to balance the need for information against potential harm, whereby uh, there needs to be this sensitivity to certain um, uh, types of people, you know, juveniles, sex crime survivors, and those unable to give consent. That there, a lot of these these elements are often uh, overlooked. It's either they are they are mistakenly overlooked or they are not taken into consideration. Both of which actually needs to be corrected uh, because these are very very major concerns moving forward. Uh, and then the next part, and this is a part where I believe a lot of journalists are also quite. Not, not a lot of journalists, but media outlets often do not see their role in this, whereby in presenting the news, they are actually, their role is to support civil discourse. The idea here is that they have to support open and civil exchange of news through the uh, through providing enough information for the public to make judgment, and they also have to make sure that they sort of like avoid sensationalization, clickbait, or dishonest headlines. All of these things, which I would say that uh, the majority of Malaysian media actually have engaged in in some way, shape or form, essentially. And finally, the last part, which is to consider the long term implications of publications. Sometimes uh, journalists, um, media outlets will publish stories that have very, very uh, devastating or sort of like dangerous implications and but don't uh, sort of see that effect before they publish. You know, we've seen it when, when it came to issues regarding um, the sort of like the Rohingya uh, migrant issue that happened uh, in the middle of last year and a lot of other cases as well. And then finally, with regards to social responsibility, public transparency is another major component, which I think very few media outlets actually practice, which is this idea that you need to be very uh, clear, very transparent in explaining your ethical choices and processes to the audience. The idea here is that whatever that you decide to do, whether there's a conflict of interest or whether you are presenting something that is sponsored content or you are there is a certain bias that is present you have to be very very transparent with that and in doing so you actually instill uh, public trust that you are actually being upfront and clear about all of these potential conflicts of interest but very rarely do you see any of our media of course uh, sort of like taking this sort of high road in presenting themselves and these are all issues that we sort of see in the Malaysian media landscape essentially. So with all of these in mind, uh, I would like to sort of like, and I suppose because we've got two members on the pro tem committee here, that these are some ethical challenges that we have for the media council. And despite the fact of how I sort of worded it in a very, very negative manner, I am aware that even though this might sound quite critical, I'm also, um, I also believe that the media were forced into this situation because they had to survive in this very, very precarious environment, whereby if you make a wrong move, if you publish something that um, angered the wrong person, you would be on the tail end of some sort of court order or some sort of uh, half a million dollar, half a million ringgit fine and such and such. And as a result of that, most media in this country essentially in the last 
50 years or so, has started to focus more on economic interest over ethical reporting. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that all of this is good, but that's sort of like the situation that the media have been forced to go into it. And looking at the sort of like the threat from, you know, uh, big data, from international media, from, you know, social media, this threat is becoming even more precarious in recent times. And therefore, uh, when the Media Council is sort of like being set up, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that it is supposed to be a self-regulating body, meaning that it's not going to, even though it's going to be... Um, it will probably come in as a form of a, uh, a statutory body. It is going to be self-regulated by the public as well as the media themselves. And so in most cases, whenever you have a self-regulating body, the quality of ethics that is produced is often the standard set of rules or that is shared between all members as well. But considering how the majority of the Malaysian media, the ethics levels are, quality of ethics is a little bit questionable. That is uh, going to be a potential problem, whereby if you enact a media council that follows and sort of like reinforces these same problematic practices, you're not going to see any improvements and you're probably going to see people double down on all of these uh, practices as well. And as a result, that probably uh, one thing that I think the media council should really go for would be to become focus on becoming more aspirational and not reflect existing practices essentially. And in order to really do this, this is where the voice of NGOs such as CIJ and also members of the public must support the formation of the media council. Like right now, I believe the pro -time committee is the only one that's really sort of pushing for it and they're working behind the scenes. Whereas, you know, for everybody, yes, understandably, COVID has become a major concern and that's really on everyone's mind. But the media council is something that people need to start becoming more vocal about and to start engaging it because it is incredibly important. Ever since uh, the fall of the Barisan National Government in 2018, um, there are a lot of the media controls uh, regulations in place have pretty much been uh, somewhat uh, let go a little bit, but that also means that the media council has to become more and more important as we're starting to see a lot more unethical practices become more commonplace in today's uh, media landscape. And so the media council should therefore be based on strong ethical values that rise above the current standards of basic and sometimes reckless journalism, essentially. All right. So uh, that is it for my presentation for today. Uh, I mean, this is really just sort of like uh, a very, very academic perspective of looking at the situation. I'm not, uh, I'm aware that this is going to be uh, quite uh, controversial to a certain extent uh, compared to the other panelists here. So, but I'm very open to sort of like opening a discussion, you know, trying to get people to be thinking more critically about the role of media in this country and to see how we can go with it. So I'm looking forward to questions later on and uh, passing back to you, James. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ben, uh, for, for that overview on, on legal, professional and uh, the social dimensions uh, of uh, media ethics in Malaysia. So we now turn to uh, uh, practitioner uh, Zurairi, who's a news editor of the Malay Mail based in KL. Uh, he's also the East Asian representative of the International Association of Religion uh, Journalists. A fun fact, uh, he runs a subscriber-based only essay collection on Malaysian social media, as well as uh, uh, social audio chat rooms over uh, Clubhouse and Twitter spaces. So do check him out over there as well. So Zurairi, the floor is yours. Salam everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice to spend uh, this afternoon with uh, esteemed friends. Uh, I would like to preface by uh, a disclaimer that, you know, uh, I'm not here representing uh, my publication and employers, and of course, all views and opinions are personal. Um, but I am happy uh, to share my experiences as a journalist who's working in middle management uh, in the news industry. And what Benjamin has presented uh, in the past minutes are exactly the kind of challenges that you have to balance uh, when you are straddling that line between uh, the editor and also being a journalist. Uh, is, is the kind of uh, concerns and considerations that we go through uh, every single day. And also, uh, I am happy to hear uh, my friends, uh, Tamina and Washla, uh, talking about the same things that I've been uh, focusing on. Uh, and today, uh, I, I will uh, mostly uh, offer my uh, opinion and views on two of my uh, pet topics, I guess, uh, which are uh, religion and also uh, social media. Uh, when it comes to uh, ethics on uh, religion uh, reporting, uh, I find that uh, it, in Malaysia, we have this interesting uh, situation where 
uh, the status quo uh, sometimes uh, pretty much uh, excluded from uh, ethical considerations when it comes to journalism. Uh, what, what I mean here is that we have uh, journalists and news publications who, who adhere uh, to journalism ethics, but when it comes to reporting uh, quotes or views from religious authorities, especially uh, the status quo, uh, for some reason, uh, that the considerations and concern just uh, goes out of the window. Uh, the news uh, industry and journalists, when it, when it comes to reporting uh, these kind of topics, are expected to present uh, the views of religious authorities almost uncritically without without any dissent and again as as Wachla has uh, mentioned before it, this is a sort of like a reflection of uh, the social political background in Malaysia where uh, we have a religious tradition where uh, religion are essentially uh, sanctioned and that there is a version of uh, religion that is uh, sanctioned by the state and where uh, any critical thought or dissent or any uh, opposing uh, or, or, or views that are out of the mainstream uh, tends to be not only uh, discouraged, but uh, in some ways can also be illegal. And this uh, inevitably uh, leads us off towards journalism as well, where uh, simply uh, viewing uh, the topic of religion critically uh, is seen as you know blasphemous and inevitably leads to you know for example police report and also investigation and and overall condemnation by uh, the uh, majority demography and I find uh, that when it comes to uh, writing about uh, religious topics uh, in, in in news uh, in news uh, there is still that. Um, uh, the way of writing it is still rooted in uh, quoting uh, religious authorities uh, blindly uh, instead of uh, quoting uh, stakeholders in certain issues. Uh, for example, I mean, what Shlai and also Tamina has been saying before about gender and also about uh, minorities. Uh, of, for example, let's let's talk about the LGBT because <laughs> there seems to be the elephant in the room. Uh, most often than not, uh, religious authorities uh, are put as the paramount uh, view on the certain topic when in fact in real life they are not even stakeholders uh, of, of the uh, issue right uh, it should be the lgbt community uh, themselves but they are rarely quoted in self instead we have religious authorities uh, who are quoted uh, as the uh, be all and, and all of, 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 of an issue and uh, we see this in a couple of uh, cases perhaps i would like to uh, talk about three uh, case studies that uh, in the past uh, year or so uh, first of course uh, the big issue right now uh, regarding uh, transgender tycoon uh, Nur Sajjad. Uh, we, we, we see how uh, she is being vilified uh, on the same level as <laughs> Joe Lowe <laughs> uh, and, and other people, other fugitives uh, that uh, simply for uh, expressing uh, her gender. And we have media uh, taking uh, the police uh, statements of, and, and then um, not only uh, using uh, her dead name, as uh, we mentioned before, but actually uh, publishing her last known address <laughs> in, in a news report. I mean, uh, without any concern about the harm that, that could cause uh, an individual. And uh, there was also um, uh, the issue of how the National Human Rights uh, Commission's uh, proposal uh, to study uh, the third gender, which is which was just a proposal <laughs> for a study, it's not even a study yet, and it's not even a proposal to change uh, any laws. But uh, the way it is being reported is uh, sort of like you know they are trying to uh, ruin the sanctity of the religion and also uh, change the framework of how uh, the country and the society works. And I find that it stems from how uh, we view certain uh, narratives regarding uh, religion uh, as, as being uh, the, the, the number one uh, consideration when, when it is not. And I think uh, I would just to, uh, to, to show uh, ethical considerations, I would like to uh, talk about this one case studies where uh, a, a publication uh, reported 
uh, a clamor of furor uh, towards uh, the, the ice, an ice cream brand from Australia called Golden Gay Time, which if you're familiar with it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an icon, it's an Australian icon, right? But the way that it is being presented is as though that selling Golden Gay Time ice cream is, a, is a, an, it's an agenda to spread pro-LGBT uh, you know, <laughs> agenda in Malaysia. And, and they quoted uh, a Muslim uh, consumer group uh, again, it is what I was mentioning uh, just now about how uh, the media tend to quote uh, non-experts and non-stakeholders in issues that would inevitably harm certain community. And uh, talking uh, on on the second part uh, of uh, what I wish to focus today is on uh, social media. Uh, inevitably, social media has becoming more and more uh, crucial. Uh, part of the uh, news industry um, and at the same time uh, the journalists also have to contend uh, with uh, social media. I mean we have to be faster than uh, social media reports uh, but at the same time we also are expected to spread uh, our stories on social media as well. Uh, so when it comes to this right uh, uh, what I see what I see is that social media administrators, uh, do not seem to be uh, trained in journalism or in news as, as uh, their colleagues uh, in the newsroom, which results in uh, certain social media posts being sometimes uh, misleading or even uh, downright uh, wrong. You know, a news story may be fine, uh, accurate, but when it is presented on social media because the administrators do not have the same... Uh, grasp of uh, news or, or politics even or, or uh, things that are normally uh, you know covered by uh, journalists it tends to you know resulting in uh, certain social media posts being uh, inaccurate and also uh, be, uh, and also some posts uh, I, I I'm not sure whether this is a, a feature unique to Malaysian uh, social media accounts but sometimes when it comes to certain languages, the, the approach towards news tend to be unprofessional and you know because of the need to uh, portray yourself uh, as someone uh, that is approachable and friendly but it it, it turns out to be uh, not as professional as a news uh, publication should be and another bigger uh, issue when it comes to journalism and ethics and social media i think is um this benjamin has mentioned this before about, about consent about cons consent on uh, using content from social media uh private persons are being treated as public figures just because they have a public social media account and that without and and i think a lot of uh, media organizations fail to grasp how uh, by amplifying a certain social media post of a private individual could inevitably lead to harm especially when they do not even seek consent uh, to run certain those kind of stories so you see uh, certain uh, posts that are initially perhaps meant for a close for a close circle of friends because it's a public account it became viral and then inevitably it get reported by uh, a news organization on a national level and it, it, it puts spotlight to a person that do not necessarily want to have that spotlight and and all, and this most of the times happen because uh, I guess in our industry in Malaysia we do not have this. You know, again, it comes to the code of conduct on how to deal with this on social media. I mean, in other countries where uh, social media reporting have been more developed, uh, there is some sort of uh, unspoken uh, agreement where you have to approach uh, an individual on social media before uh, and, and, and get their consent before you either want to run uh, their story or use their content, for example, photos, uh, images, uh, videos, and so on before you use them. But I would say in our in our industry, the norm seems to be, you know, if it's public, it's free to use, which I think it may be acceptable when social media was quite small a few years back, but nowadays it carries a lot of uh, you know consequences towards uh, the people that we amplify uh, in in media, uh, and not to mention you know copyright laws and so on uh, and. Uh, just to share an experience, I think a couple of months back, I was tasked uh, to sort of like uh, draft a guidelines on 
the social media reporting and uh, there's a lot uh, of uh, feedback uh, from uh, Twitter uh, that you know that there is a need for 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 this because we are dealing with private individuals not uh, not with public figures such as politicians or you know uh, leaders of the country and I think if I may uh, add on or elaborate a bit on what uh, my uh, fellow panelists have uh, said before about infodemic you know it, it is it is um i find that uh, when it comes to reporting uh on scientific uh, issues uh, that there is seems to be uh, we, we still do not have uh many reporters or journalists who are trained to write about science and i thought that you know covid19 would provide us some sort of like a you know uh, to shock us into thinking you know there is a need for news publications uh to be uh to, to put a little bit more concern when it comes to scientific uh matters uh, when when to write writing about scientific uh stories i mean of course uh, covid 19 uh vaccines uh, we, we we see some um publications just you know straight up uh amplifying and uh, giving space to uh, anti-vaxxers, uh, uh, individuals, uh, figures, uh, doctors, and also to you know, uh, and also to publish uh, opinions and um, stories about, for example, uh, we we had a big uh, topic about the use of the drug ivermectin uh, when it comes to handling COVID nineteen, and it was uh, surprising how a lot of uh, media publications just you know. Uh, publish an opinion on that a, a, a topic as heavy as that that could affect lives so wantonly without any critical thought on whether someone should be published outright or not and also uh, like Benjamin has said about uh, the use of sources when it comes to political uh, stories again uh, it, 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 it's not only when it when it comes to political stories that the use of sources become apparent uh, I I it is unfortunate that there are some government agencies that also use this approach where they would, you know, sort of like, uh, it's, not, it's not even leak. <laughs> it is, it, it comes from a credible and official source where the, the, the source would, you know, you know, you can write about this, but do not quote me as a certain, certain uh, official in the government agency. You just put it as a source and then uh, I will confirm it in my official capacity. And I find that very, uh, amusing, but why? Again, why is this happening? Uh, it all comes down to all this, you know, systemic <laughs> problem on how there are, you know, uh, things uh, we we do not have uh, open data or open government, uh, no uh, freedom of information uh, act, and you know, all all this uh, melts into uh, this situation right now where agencies want the media to cover their. Uh, their views, but they perhaps out of bureaucracy cannot do so <laughs> freely. And uh, I think uh, that's all I have to say right now. I'm looking forward to the questions and uh, that is all for me today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move very quickly to, uh, to the Q&A. And as I go to the Q&A, uh, this is also a moment for, for those of you who are in the audience to take a quick survey uh, as to the uh, to the event, and while while I have that survey question, you know, um, uh, icon there for you, uh, let me uh, do a few quick fire uh, questions. Uh, uh, speakers, you know, some of you I know will need to go off quickly, so uh, just short, you know, forty five second tops, one minute uh, uh, response. Uh, the first question to all speakers, I will kick off with Tamina. So the question is this. Do you see media ethics in Malaysia as primarily an individual, institutional, or a structural societal issue? Okay, I repeat, do you see media ethics in Malaysia as primarily as an individual, institutional, or a structural societal issue? Tamila, before you answer, there's mm -hmm. one uh, question, sure, sure. question directed to you which is uh, asking for advice. Uh, Tamina, could you share with young aspiring broadcast journalists some advice and also some of your experiences in becoming a, a broadcast journalist? What are the skills needed, et cetera? So if you could just quick fire both questions, please. Tamina, over to you. 
Okay, sure thing. Thanks for that, Dr. James. Um, so for the first one, I feel that when it comes to the lack of um, structural and institutional reforms, um, the onus for ethical journalism, honestly, falls on the individual. And um, I feel that individuals, even if you are a junior, uh, junior entry-level journalist coming in, you can still stick to your principles, you can still stick to broader media ethics, and that actually has a lot of influence in how your newsroom moves forward. If there are enough cogs within the machine, honestly, it will come together eventually. And we see this increasingly amongst um, those newsrooms that have a better uh, diversity in terms of age, and especially in terms of gender, you've got, um, of course, um, sites uh, and uh, publications like Malaysia Kini, Malay Mail, even Safe, where they increasingly do a lot more gender-sensitized journalism. It also comes from the fact that a few of them also have um, sensitized copy editors. So it does fall down to the individual at the end of the day. Um, and uh, very quickly, I also wanted to emphasize that um, as, as far as it comes to public broadcast, um, this is one of the things that was most interesting to me from my time in uh, Berlin at the media workshops there. So public broadcast funding over there is citizen-backed, transparent, and this all comes through a license fee, which is known as the Rundfunk Breitag. So this option as a model is one to actionably move towards and also one which was in some detail discussed in the proposed uh, Media, Media Council Act that was briefed by all of us. Um, okay, from there, moving on into advice for aspiring broadcast journals. I think it has, there has never been a better time to join journalism, despite the fact that it may sometimes sound like a little bit of doom and gloom when it comes to sustainability, et cetera. Um, as an independent uh, female broadcast journal, I would say what matters most is to be able to maintain your independence of voice. That does come with a lot of trials, um, some amongst them, which is um, diversifying your income stream and also continuing to build your black book as well as contact, but also which publications that you work for. And um, last and uh, perhaps not least, when it comes to working within organizations, try to ensure that you are somewhat moving the needle towards not just gender mainstreaming, but having a much more humanitarian lens in the work that you do. Um, try and also um, look actively for mentorship. This is particularly critical when it comes to female journalists because mentorship is um, directly, uh, directly inverse with um, opportunities for career progression. And this is possibly what um, we have the most dearth of when it comes to the Malaysian media landscape. I'm in my late 30s, and I must say that it has been um, there have literally been no um, female mentors on the horizon because most women actually phase out, especially from the broadcast media industry, by the time we're in our 40s. So yes, um, every, every uh, microcosm of um, sexism, patriarchy that exists in society, that is of course also reflected within the wider landscape of media. It's a tough road, but I don't think there's ever been a better time to be a part of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamina. Over to Washla, Ben, and Zurairi in that order. Washla, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I, I would agree with Tamina as well. I would look at it uh, perhaps um, starting at the systemic and structural level. Uh, when we talk about ethics, um, it you know, there, say, for example, if you're talking about ethical gender reporting, yeah, there are so many, um, you know, mindsets and, you know, uh, issues around misogyny, toxic masculinity, all that needs to be unpacked, yeah, and that can only happen at a systemic structural level first, and, and that involves the entire society, you know, the different levels of policy changes that needs to happen. And, oh, and once that's happened, you know, it, it, does, it doesn't mean that without that happening, nothing else can happen, but that can then trickle down to an institutional level change because institu it, a lot of things will have to be institutionalized and cannot be left to just you know, open to interpretation. And at the institutional level, especially when it comes to media organization, there has to be clarity actually, or some level of 
you know, um, systemic approach or systematic approach, I'll say, uh, to policies. Yeah, how, what are the policies? What are the standards we are incorporating in all the newsrooms? And how are these actually translated into practice? Are people getting the necessary training, uh, uh, trainings? Are there all the necessary procedures, mechanisms in place if I have some challenges with regards to understanding or interpreting these standards and ethical uh, practices? And also what is really important is at the institutional level and, and the need for institutionalizing these at the media level is to ensure there is enough consultation with all the affected parties within the media organization. And finally, then it boils down to the individual because now the individual will have to unpack own you know, individual biases, stereotypes, prejudices, but at least if it's you know a, a policy that's been institutionalized, you have a way that would guide you forward uh, towards you know understanding, unpacking, and interpreting ethical reporting. Yeah. So we need to look at it. Cannot be looked at in in silos. No, could it be looked at in isolation? It requires all three elements. You know, in pushing forward a more progressive and you know uh, more um, current, I would say, also reform around ethics. Ben. All right, thank you very much, James. Uh, okay, so for this question, if you have asked me this question about 20 years ago, I probably just say you definitely need to have some structural or institutional uh, efforts in order to make these changes. But I think echoing what Tamina said that um, journalists today, individual working journalists have a lot more clout than they had before. As we already mentioned before, most modern day um, media outlets actually do rec uh, recommend or they do sort of like, um, motivate their own journalists to actually have their own social media accounts. So they actually have their own presence. They have their own, and in a certain sense, um, uh, uh, individual reporters or journalists can actually become influencers in their own right. And in sort of like doing things in their own way, you know, advancing your own uh, aspirational goals for media ethics, that in itself is going to be enough to sort of push the tide and to become a force for change. And I think that's something that we're also seeing that's happening on a more global scale. You know, this idea that, um, you know, social media has really sort of like enabled people to feel that they have a voice and they actually can build their own platform and find their own audience and also uh, see the sort of like the power that they have in themselves. And I think that is also coming forth towards journalists. But of course, um, and so I guess for Malaysian journalists as well, in order to sort of make these changes, there needs to be a bigger push for uh, Malaysian journalists to believe that they can actually advance these changes on their own and not rely necessarily on their bosses or their media outlets to support them. Because really the, the individual has a lot more power than they ever did before. Okay, thank you. Yes, Zorairi. Yeah, if I may add, uh, I, I think I would like to focus on the readers themselves. Uh, as in, you know, there, there, <laughs> there is no bigger threat to a media organi organization than not being trusted. And all this comes from the readers. So there needs to be uh, an incentive for media organizations uh, to be ethical. So, and one of, these, one of the ways is for readers to, you know, demand that and makes it worthwhile uh, and an incentive for organizations to not only be ethical, but also uh, like Benjamin has said, you know, uphold that social responsibility. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I know, uh, you know, Tamina, you, you may have to go. Uh, so please feel yes. free to, to, to drop off uh, if you need to. Uh, I just have right. a, a final round of questions. Um, and, thank you uh, all. Thank you, yeah. all uh, Tamina, right. for being with us. Thank you I, all. Yeah, uh, see you soon. And uh, final round of questions uh, uh, in no particular order as, as I see it in front of me. Uh, uh, the first question, and they are all different questions. First, uh, you know, um, to Washla, how will ethics be strongly influenced by cultural norms? What is your take there? Uh, the next question is, uh, how do you think knowledge of ethics affects Indian journalism. This question is to Ben, but I'll slash it and I say uh, vernacular journalism. If if you can, you know, stretch stretch the requirement there, and then uh, uh, to Zurairi, I mean, uh, you are engaged uh, also a lot in uh, social media and technology. So, uh, what's your sense from where you are sitting? You know, um, the role of artificial uh, artificial intelligence. If you can offer us an opinion 
uh, about how it would affect uh, journalism. So, Washla, um, uh, over to you, just a, a quick fire response. This is a tough call, James, asking me to do a quick fire response. It's like a two hour session on cultural relativism, <laughs> actually. But you know, it's a really important thing because I also noticed a, a question in the chat box about our Rukun Negara, you know, uh, and the fifth one is about Kesopanan and Kesusilaan. Uh, we have to be a little wary when we, when we leave ethics open to discussion within the context of culture especially because culture can never be taken you know, apart from culture and religion in, in most cases. The discourse around cultural relativism is very, very risky because that discourse has a potential of undermining human rights. Yeah. So when we uh, speak about ethics, I think we need to also locate the discussion about media ethics or any kind of ethics within established standards of you know, any human being on, on the basis of certain fundamental principles about non-discrimination, equality, access to justice. So when if we are being influenced by cultural norms, Culture varies, culture dif uh, differs, and culture is open to interpretation. So I would say ethics, especially media ethics, journalism ethics, needs to be grounded within principles that are agreed, established, normative, and grounded. And then that's why I always push for grounded within policies and laws to, that are more progressive. I don't want regressive laws are influenced. I would also be very wary sometimes when we talk about Asian values and Asian culture, because that in itself creates additional barriers and leaves a lot of, you know, it leaves it open to interpretation uh, where people add on different barriers and lenses. Yeah. So to be very cautious when we say that it, ethics, culture, social norms, these are risks that we have to be very clear of, wary of, and move towards creating a space that is more progressive for discourse and where we also look at it within uh, emerging and evol evolving context. Yeah? So that's just some um, quick response on this. Yeah, th and thank you, you uh, Washla. You made the hard job sound easy, actually, but thank you so much. Uh, ben, over to you on the stretched vernacular response. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, James. So a very, very interesting question. So I guess it's also kind of similar to Washla, you know, basically looking at the differences in cultural uh, culture that influences, you know, when we look at vernacular journalism, people always like to view them as completely distinct and separate sort of like branches of journalism to a certain extent. You've got the English language, you've got the Malay language, and even you've got Chinese, you've got a Mandarin and Tamil speaking uh, medium as well. And the idea here is that they should not be viewed as separate entities and therefore should have the same uh, sort of like ethical, they should have the same ethical values as uh, as said uh, by Washla earlier. I mean, to, to support what she said essentially. But the idea here is that you are also aware that yes, different languages do have different uh, cultural values and dimensions that do need to be taken into account. But the, that's really the main point of having a very strong code of ethics, whereby the, the, the these ethics are what we call normative ethics are very universal. They can apply to a variety of different situations and dimensions. And as a result of that, they can actually be applied and utilized regardless of what we perceive to be cultural, uh, sort of like cultural differences, then they actually can apply quite evenly. And to a certain extent, I think one of the main problems that we have currently right now is that people often only pay attention to the English and the Malay speaking uh, sort of like media language spaces. You know, all of the vernacular spaces are either ignored or they're just seen as like the other and not really uh, considered to be part of like the national uh, discourse essentially. So maybe if by integrating these things into uh, well, the media council or into the sort of like what we think as the proper, the entire holistic media discourse, this will be one way to actually make sure that all of these different media spaces are starting to converge. Because I think, you know, I attended one of the, one of the earlier meetings to sort of discuss the uh, sort of like the media council like many, many, like many, many years ago now at this point. And, you know, there was very, a very clear distinction, you know, even within the, the different language, um, uh, the different language speaking based media outlets, there were a lot of different views and viewpoints and different, um, you, they, they viewed themselves as different um, sort of like a different perspectives, but actually they were all from the same fraternity of journalism, but they didn't see themselves as united. And I think that's one of the main problems that needs to be overcome here, that journalists in Malaysia actually are part of the same profession. They all have the same values. They just need to make 
just get on the same page essentially. And I think that's the one important thing that needs to be done first and foremost. So thank you for that, James. Zurairi, run, uh, moving from <laughs> culture to technology, yes. Yeah, I, I for one welcome our robot overlords. Uh, I do not have uh, a negative, uh, I, I view AI as interesting. I mean, uh, I would welcome an AI that could process uh, press statements for me in just five minutes rather than waiting for, I mean, for, for, for a reporter to write in, you know, 30 minutes because it would inevitably lead to human journalists doing the real work, more important work rather than just, you know, uh, journalism is no longer just, you know, processing press statements. Uh, we need to provide analysis and I think this is where uh, the work of journalists become much more important in this age of social media because, you know, we, we, we are not just uh, stenographers, we need to provide analysis, we need to curate content for our uh, readers, uh, we need to uh, uh, advocate for certain certain values, uh, that, that, that is our brand, you know, uh, not, not, not just a name or a logo. Uh, and uh, that is one, and I, if I may uh, uh, elaborate or talk about uh, Mark's uh, comment uh, on Rukun Negara, I think when it comes to the five principles, right, I think a lot of us always forget that the, the, the preamble of Rukun Negara comes with, you know, uh, a democratic way of life, you know, a just society, a liberal approach towards uh, traditional values, a progressive society. And it is more important to have an ethical and a progressive uh, journalism industry in order for us to reach uh, all this ambition. Uh, and I, I would not worry so much about what, I, I mean, I, I would advise uh, any new journalist or my fellow journalists for us not to be, I mean, despite all the restrictions, not to be so concerned about what the government may think about us doing our job, because li literally our, our responsibility does not lie with the powers that be. It is with the marginalized, it is with the public. Uh, we have to hold you know, power to account and all that. Uh, and I think that is much more important than uh, worrying about us trying to offend the government. And I think that is all uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. With this, you know, um, I will uh, very quickly uh, wrap up and thank everyone uh, for the event. Uh, as promised earlier, I wanted to highlight that uh, Asia Centre uh, will be convening an international conference its seventh one on freedom of expression in Asia on 24 and 26 August in Bangkok. Uh, this will be preceded by an exciting uh, year we have next year planned around media. We've some, we have some key partners. Uh, we are working with Oxfam on a uh, journalism award around inequality. We are developing a series of uh, seminars, webinars with Internews. We are also working with our long-time partners, the Friedrich uh, Nauman Foundation's regional offices, media program on press freedom in Asia, and some podcasts and other uh, uh, out, outputs uh, following from a baseline studies. Uh, we also have plans on national projects in the Philippines um, uh, with, with colleagues in Malaysia, uh, Cambodia and Indonesia and Thailand. So I, I, I hope to bring out, uh, you know, as we develop and tighten these programs with our various partners, uh, more announcement and I look forward to collaborating with uh, all, all of you. Um, I just wanted to highlight that the work that Asia Centers do, especially around media, is hubbed around our second office uh, in Malaysia. Uh, that's Iskandar Putri, Johor Bahru, Malaysia. So to all Malaysian friends, you know, now that you can do interstate travel, uh, jump to Asia Center, Iskandar uh, Putri. With that, uh, once again, I thank everyone. Uh, uh, at Taylor's University School of Media uh, and Communication, all, all the uh, esteemed speakers, all the friends and uh, audiences uh, who have joined us. Uh, we will have a short event write-up posted on our website. As well, we'll curate and edit a, a version of this video that will be also uploaded uh, on the YouTube channel. With that, once again, uh, from all of us here at Asia Centre, uh, to all of you out there, uh, we wish you a, a very good afternoon. Bye. And, and, and uh, see you soon. <laughs>